Director of Education at Robolink. And this video is our introduction to Codron. And this is great if you need to persuade someone to buy Codron for you. So maybe you are an education distributor and you're looking to add Codron to your lineup. You could be a teacher that needs it for their classroom, a summer camp provider, whatever. This hopefully will help you out. So we're Robolink. What we do is make cute, approachable teaching tools that bring programming to life and teach real industry competency. So this video is going to be focusing on Codrone. It's the world's first programmable drone for education. And what that means, it is not able to fly straight out of the box. Students need to learn how to program it before they can fly it. So this is great. For 3rd to 12th grade students, there are three languages that they can use to program the drone. And then we also have Rocket Smart, that is an 11 in 1 robot kit that teaches students how to build and program all of those robots. And it uses one language to do that. Not included in this is Zumi, that is our self driving car kit that teaches artificial intelligence through the lens of autonomous transportation. The reason it's not included is because it will be launching this summer. So, again, we're just going to be focusing on Codrone. And there are two different versions of Codrone. Hardware is basically the same, but capabilities and software are a little bit different. So Codrone Lite, that is more suitable for grades three and up, and it can do block coding through Blockly and text coding through Python. And you can program everything directly on a computer. It is compatible with Chromebooks. We know that those are being used in a lot of schools right now. Um, Codrone Pro does everything that the light does. So that is Blockly, that's Python, the programming directly on a computer. Um, but it also has an Arduino compatible remote. And because of that, text coding in Arduino is available for Codrone Pro. This is for grade six and up because Arduino is more complicated than Blockly and Python. Um, so it is more suitable for older students. And that remote that you see is buildable and programmable. So it comes disassembled, students will need to build it so they can learn about um, like electricity transfer and everything. And then all the programming takes place through that remote. Um, a few people ask this once in a while, um, if Codrone is compatible with tablets or other mobile devices and at the moment it is not that is something that we are looking into so you know one of the questions that you might get is why would you want to fly a drone in your class and it really makes code come to life because it's made for education students get to see their code become tangible as opposed to seeing at a computer screen and then hoping that everything works out well you know they get to see every command that they put in in the air through their codrome and it also gets them out of their seats you know so um we have a lot of students that started out with programming with code.org they dumped the hour of code they saw elsa skating on a pond in a snowflake and that is great for beginners but then they get bored and they want to move on and being able to kind of fly a drone across the room and run after it is an amazing experience and it motivates them to keep going. And it turns into a bit of a mini PE class with all the running around. So just be prepared for that. Um, and the students can graduate within Codrone. So once they are finished with block-based coding through Blockly, they can move on to Python. And once they're finished with Python, they can move on to Arduino. And when I say finished, like, I don't mean like, okay, all the lessons are over, you're done. I mean, when they feel like they have mastered all the content, they've done a ton of challenges, then they can proceed to the next big thing. And Codron really makes any subject very exciting, and we're going to talk about this with the next couple of slides, but you don't need to be very creative to figure out how Codron can be used in a science classroom, a social studies classroom, a foreign language classroom. Um, 
you could really just use it anywhere to teach any subject and we do have some ideas for you if you get kind of stuck finally robots are the future you know like computer programming is becoming essential and robots are going to be integral in our lives within the next couple of deca decades. So students really do need to be prepared to work with them and to be able to um, kind of learn how they work after they graduate from school. So all of our curriculum is Common Core and Next Gen Science Standard aligned. You will see that in every lesson plan. And we have some lesson examples for you. Um, so if you are a math teacher, you know, you probably don't have a lot of fun stuff going on in your classroom. Like you don't always get the field trips. You don't always get the um, ed tech tools. So this is for you. Um, you can measure drone flight time or distance to be put in a graph and blockly we are going to be adding sensors and that will be able to kind of plot data in a graph within blockly as well um, you can measure size of the shape to determine the perimeter area volume and surface area and it isn't here but you could also use degrees and measure degrees um, to see a codrome's rotation you can use mathematical operations to change the value of a variable and that goes for any of the languages and you can fly to points on a coordinate plane and again that kind of goes with the graphing um, but less of the statistics more of the algebra um, with science, you could talk about atmospheric and air pressure with the codron propellers. You could also talk about the physics of flight, like the forces that would act on a drone, and where Newton's laws would apply, especially if the drone crashes. And the drones will be crashing a lot, just get used to it. Um, you could also apply NGSS engineering standards to any of our missions. So at the end of each lesson, there is a challenge that students need, co need to complete. So they're pretty straightforward. But you could also add more parameters. If there's an obstacle course, you could have students design that before um, flying through it, that kind of thing. For social studies, you can map out and fly famous routes. Like here I have Magellan and Earhart just because they're the ones that kind of flew around the world and would be a much bigger project, but you could do something even smaller than um, their um, travel. You could also do a search and rescue mission um, to kind of rescue victims of a natural disaster. So with that, you could talk about like where a natural disaster would happen, um, you know, the landscape of an area to kind of um, plot that out, like plot out a course. And we will be showing a video in another webinar of a search and rescue mission showcase that we did um, at an event. For English language arts, you could talk about using pseudocode before programming. So pseudocode, for those of you that don't know, is um, a plain language description of a complex program. So having students do that really helps them kind of realize um, what they need to do or what they did with the program. Um, they could also give multi-step instructions. They will be reading multi-step instructions as well. And then what we have in each lesson plan for their evaluation is to write in a reflection log and answer some questions and so you could really turn that into something bigger than just a couple questions and like have them do it on a much bigger scale and require that at the end of every lesson to get them thinking about what they've done and writing it down for foreign language, you can give instructions and directions in the target language. Um, so Kodra, I mean, if you're going left, right, forward, backward, like make sure they're using the target language's vocabulary for that. Um, for the arts, you could choreograph a drone show with lights and music. You could do long exposure light painting. Um, you could also use our FPV camera module for shooting a movie, and that is available on our website in the shop section if that is something that you would like to do. You can see tutorials and lesson plans at robolink.basecamp.com. So at the beginning of a lesson where it's applicable, there will be a lesson plan. Um, the only tutorials that wouldn't have it are the ones for installation and for missions. 
So we have some tips for a classroom. Um, so we recommend about one drone for every two to three students. That helps keep chaos slightly down. And it's also great for our teaching, pair programming, collaboration, um, you know, all the great 21st century skills that we're trying to target that you might not get with a student working by themselves. But if that is something that you were able to do, then we encourage that as well. We don't recommend more than three students per drone just because that's when one kid in the group will get bored, another one will be left out. That's when you have like inner team fighting. So two to three students is kind of the golden number for this one. Definitely get extra accessories. So um, batteries have about an eight minute life. They will kind of go through that quickly. So have extra batteries on hand. Multi-chargers will help you charge those batteries faster. Motors and propellers, you might not need as much as extra batteries, but they're good to have just in case. Um, definitely keep the batteries charged. Again, eight minute life, it takes about 40 to 45 minutes for a battery to charge. So just have them ready to swap. You know, as soon as one is dead, I guess, then plug it in, but take another one that's fully charged out so a student can use it. Classroom size should be ideally about 15 by 15 by 10 feet. You could get away with 10 by 10 by 10 feet, or you could just use the school gymnasium if you have one. And stay indoors. I mean, I know summer camp is coming up. You're probably thinking it would be great to fly a drone outside, but they're small and they don't resist wind very well. So they will get stuck in a tree or on a building very easily. And the other thing that we didn't put in here is that um, the Bluetooth range is about 50, 50 feet. So um, once it flies out of that, then it will perform the last command that it can read, which might not be the one you want. Definitely test these out before class. So, you know, give yourself a week or two if you need to go through the lessons, go through the code on educator guide that's available at the beginning of every language. Um, you know, if you have kids at home, uh, if you have students that will really be interested in this, you can get them to help you test. And that helps you pick up like tips and tricks that you know, might not be in this presentation or in the educator guide or in a lesson plan. So that will help you out a lot. Always have a kill switch. There is one already programmed into Blockly, but not in Python, Python and Arduino. So if the drone goes out of control, you should always have a way to shut it off. Um, for a classroom, we recommend dividing it into programming and flying areas, and that will avoid that will help with crashes. It, I, it, we say to avoid crashes into people, but inevitably something will happen. So this will help minimize it and tie things up. So if there's any long hair, there's tassels, there's like strings hanging from hoodies or other parts of clothing. Those need to be tied up so they don't get caught in propellers. And then if you have anything hanging from the ceiling that is removable, take that down as well because a drone will crash into it. It's not a question of if, it's a question of when. So if you have any questions at all, you can visit our website, robolink.com. You can visit our social media pages at robolinkinc.com. Yep, yeah, just Robolink Inc. We're on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. And you can also email me at kristen at robolink.com and we will be able to help you out. Um, hopefully this presentation helps you out and we are looking forward to seeing you next time. Thank you.